And uh, I was changing the content of my talk uh, several times during the last days because uh, I think what I would like to tell you is that I feel I have some tools which are like a Swiss knife. Uh, so a quite universal tool that you can apply in different situations. And then you can talk a lot what I'm normally doing, how complicated it is to, or how easy it is to, to, to fabricate such a knife. Or you can show how you can apply it, or you can discuss and that what I've tried today more. Why are you why it's useful to have a Swiss knife or so and, and how it works roughly speaking, so it's more a, a talk in, in orientation. So I will talk about uh, several topics. One of them is the term rigid Hilbert space. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term. Uh, it's, uh, for me, a very nice word. I'm personally using most of the time the word Banner triple for a situation where you have not only a Hilbert space, but you're seeing the Hilbert spaces embedded into a family of function spaces. So the classical approach, if you start with Fourier analysis, you would say, we try to understand uh, Fourier transform. We need integrals, therefore we start with M1. But it's much more beautiful to work with M2 because the Hilbert space is nice, and Fourier series expansion is giving you a mapping from uh, M2 on the torus into the little M2 on the integer. You have to say what L. Okay, so the square integrable functions on the interval, the periodic square integrable functions by classical Fourier analysis go to square some level sequences. This is the classical orthogonal expansion. Um, at the time of Norbert Wiener, um, there was no detailed knowledge about pointwise convergence or so, it was coming much later. So I think he was a smart person saying, well, sometimes you should look at the algebra or set of absolutely convergent Fourier series, which is nothing else but saying, well, inside of L2 you have the absolutely convergent sequences. So you have this condition that you have absolute convergence. Uh, and so the space which has Fourier coefficients, these are called the absolutely convergent Fourier series. And then people are doing functional analysis saying, okay, this is a nice Banach space. I need the linear functionals, which are of course like the linear functionals. And then somehow at the end you get the situation that you call the linear functionals, so this is all the possible linear functionals on this space with the and one arm of four coefficients. You call it pseudo measures. That's just indicating it's a little bit more, every measure is a pseudo measure, but it's a bit more general. And uh, uh, while well, this is of course an embedded into an infinity, the space of bounded sequences. So uh, what some people call rigid Hilbert space or so, I call it in this case a banach Gelfand triple, is a triple of spaces where you sit in the middle in the Hilbert space, but you restrict it to some smaller space where you have your own norm, you also have completeness. And because this is dense, so every, uh, uh, every sequence which is square summable can be approximated with finite sequences, you can also show that uh, this uh, two must sit in the dual. So I view this as the linear functionals on this here. Very much like here, the Tudor measures are this. And then, uh, to take uh, already talk about the kind of the, the goal of the, one of the goals of the talk, uh, for me, I use the terminology that this is the first Banach Gelfand triple isomorphism. It's a mapping which is for most people. Uh, change of basis you have here, um, or, or yeah, uh, no preserving, color product preserving functions. So here, for example, uh, if you think of radio transmission, you would say, well, my favorite radio station is at this frequency, and the other radio station is another frequency or so. Well, how can you get out your station from this mixture of electromagnetic signals? Well, here you see it very easily. You have something in the frequency band here, some information and some other in the other frequency band. So if you want to get your part, you cut out on the free transform side, which means you do some convolution and, and filter out. So this is for me, I call this the uh, prototypical banach for triple. And uh, well, this is already classical. And uh, for me, uh, another banach for triple appeared in the study of time frequency analysis 
which is what I tried to show you with the first picture. So the spectrogram is um, not, not a full transform of a piece of music, because that would, I mean, you can, nowadays you could take a symphony, uh, or let's say um, some Beethoven symphony or a piece of music, and really take the FFT. I mean, you get 44,100 samples, but you can take a huge FFT, but what you get is a kind of a statistical statement. There's a lot of C and G or so, so maybe this was a piece in C major or so, but not what you would like to know as a musician. You have seen this graphical score, so how do you get it? Not by letting the period go to infinity and have infinite frequency resolution, but you're doing local frequency analysis, so you, in the discrete setting you take your CD player, you put it into MATLAB and, and take FFT of lengths 512 typically, and then you move on, make sure that you're overlapping and you, you get all the information. That's actually from a practical point of view the basis for the MP3 coder. So uh, if you get compressed data from, for your piece of music or to your streaming services, they are saying, well, you don't even have to store all the full coefficients at a given moment because some of them cannot be heard. Uh, there are some psychoacoustic effects that can be used, but we, we don't have to discuss this. Now, uh, I've made the slides in such a way that people who are not present here uh, can, can uh, still follow it. So I want to mention one thing, uh, which I think is a good way to explain this, the setting that I see parallel to this one. So our main object may be the Hilbert space. But in, inside the Hilbert space, I mean, we have to maybe complicated object. We have a simple object and surrounding it, a bigger object. And for me, this situation is like rationals, real numbers, and, and complex numbers. So if somebody is asking you what is the multiplicative inverse of 3 over 4, you just write 4 over 3. And the test is clear, 3 times 4 in the denominator and 4 times 3 is the same. This is 1. And then we would like to have something like pi times 1 over pi equals 1. You should then say, can you prove it? No, you cannot prove it because this is a definition. 1 over pi is a symbol for the object which exists within the indefinite decimals and so on. But still it's very useful. Your pocket calculator gives you a good approximation or so. So how do we handle or extend all the addition, multiplication and so on, division of, of rational numbers? How do we extend it? We do it by taking limits. We take an approximation of pi, and then we do the operation that we want to do, and then you're saying it's not good enough, and I say, okay, I have to do it with a longer approximation, with a better approximation. And this is really what we are also even doing here, especially if you take the full transform uh, on the real line, which in my convention is uh, you integrate integral from minus infinity to plus infinity is a function of time against e to the 2 pi i uh, uh, t s t t t. Actually, I prefer to think we are taking something like a scalar product between your function. So we're doing something like Hilbert space, but this guy is a little bit too, too nasty. It's not L2. Therefore, this has to pay price, and together they are fitting together. And you see, in, in all these things, uh, very often this, this Hilbert space is a little bit too big and you are better restricting to something small. So, in the AFT case, everything is fine. Now, uh, we also know that complex numbers sometimes are better or a good way to explain things. So, why is the addition theorem for cosine sine valid? Well, it's a consequence of real imaginary part of complex exponentials. So, this is the setup of of uh, uh, these things, and of course, these are objects <coughs> which are kind of different. One is pairs of integers, the other is infinite decimals, and so on. Uh, but we always know when we do a computation in the large domain, we can trans go uh, make the transition. Before doing addition, we can add uh, rationals and then convert, or we, we convert each of them and add the, the decimal expressions that gives the same. So, and we can choose the level. And this is, will be very important for what I want to show you. Now, uh, I'm 
in the, from, by training a person in abstract harmonic analysis. Later on, I was trying to start numerical analysis. So really, my first experiment was, is it true that the FFT is so much faster for powers of two? This was in Maryland 30 years ago. I was getting a nice curve. So really, if you take long and longer vectors, it grows. But if you have a lot of prime factors, and especially if you have a power of two, at that time, it was really much, much faster. Modern algorithms are much more complicated, or so you cannot demonstrate this anymore in this way. But uh, so I went, was more and more interested in, in, in the applications and so on. And uh, that's why my, I called my group NUMAC, Numerical Harmonic Analysis Group. So I was trying to push from the abstract to the applied, to the numerical side, and even have some really applied problems. But it's still a situation where I have to learn a lot from the physicists and engineers. And I think it's a lot also about uh, um, uh, psychology. I mean, I had some, I was still a teacher student in mathematics physics. And uh, so now I would say what, for me at the moment, my view is what is the difference between the more applied people in physics and engineering and the mathematicians. Uh, the applied people say we have this problem and we develop some terms, sometimes a little bit vague, that was my problem as a student, uh, but they know what they want to do. Uh, but the risk is that maybe the terms are not exact enough. They are, uh, from my point of view, doing so many, some speculations. I've heard a lot of people who are moving from physics to mathematics because it's more safe. Well, but there's another danger. If you just start with axiomatic setting, and I grew up with, from the, in the Purvaki spirit or so, you just have mathematics means you have definitions, lemma, theorems, and if you want to have something more general, then you modify the axioms. Well, but I think it should be meaningful. So, uh, so you see there, there are different things, and I will try to tell you um, about things. I told you already this the past story. Actually, there's a type goes so I should hide it. Yeah, so uh, I learned about the free transform uh, as a tool which is so important, no, which is so complicated that we have to study the free transform because convolution is complicated, it's turned into the point of multiplication. And only later I realized, I mean, why should I study convolution? It's nice, I mean, I could do my PhD and then many things, but from the engineering point of view, of course, it's very important. Uh, physical laws are time invariant. So if you have a linear operator, which is based on some physical device, you can repeat the experiment. You will should get up to measurement errors the same result with with the same with some time delay. So and so these operate these operators are convolution operators. And of course, if you want to invert it, if you want to know properties, you have to study the Fourier transform. And here again, we have this this problem that. It appears very natural to say the Fourier transform is an integral transform, and if you do an integral, don't stay uh, with the Riemann integral, which is nice, but it's too limited. Lebesgue is better, and uh, I have uh, heard, not not read yet, Radon was a uh, professor at our faculty, and in his habilitation thesis, he was formulating that measure theory is the basis of functional analysis. I think this is true for, for the early period because you need LP spaces to have completeness and Banach spaces and Hilbert spaces or so. But of course, functional analysis also has developed further. So, uh, i leave out these things. Yeah, uh, if I try to talk about signals or distributions or the Banach Kelton triple uh, and also time frequency analysis, uh, we have uh, at several uh, levels, and uh, the, the problem actually was when GABA analysis was coming to the mathematics community, I should maybe mention this. Dennis Gabor was a, a person in, in physics, nowadays we might say information theory, who was doing a theory of uh, a Hungarian origin, but he was then working in London. He was theory, doing the theory of holography. Uh, and after holography was possible due to the invention of laser or the realization of laser, he was receiving the Nobel Prize. 
But he had another uh, idea which is related to time frequency analysis. I hope to explain it in a moment. And there were so many different things that, that uh, well, you think it's complicated in five different ways. And I try to separate it in, in, in some ways. So the first way is the linear algebra part. Uh, and it has to do with a very simple. So the linear algebra part uh, is, can be explained in a very simple way. Uh, in linear algebra, we are talking about the situation that ideally we describe vectors, finite dimensional vector spaces by basis. If somebody is giving you a generative system, usually I'm showing these five vectors in R3, then you know that you can throw away two of them, therefore you get the basis. So not any two, but three of them are a basis. So redundant systems can be reduced to a basis in the finite dimensional situation. If somebody is giving you two vectors in R3, you say, oh, it's not, it's linear independent, it's good, but it's not spanning the space, add something more. So, Bases are the, the cutting point between, uh, uh, between redundancy and linear independence. So the basis is a linear independent system of generators that we teach our students. Now, uh, that means that in, especially in the infinite dimensional situation, uh, we are thinking we know already what are these two concepts. Instead of something is generating, you're saying that linear, uh, the linear you have infinitely many vectors, and if the linear span is dense, you can approximate every element and then you're in a fine situation. But this is not a good viewpoint because what you don't like is a situation where you say, okay, you give me some element in your Hilbert space, some epsilon and I have, I can do an approximation. But then you're saying, no, that's not good enough. Give me a better approximation. If you're allowed to throw away everything and give me completely new coefficients, there are higher and higher oscillations, they're getting worse and worse, there's no limit, there's no representation, then it's not good. So that's what you can learn from linear algebra, uh, that there are bad and good systems. And uh, the good systems are for me the ones where everything works like linear algebra. So what is the problem of having five vectors in R3? Well, you can represent every vector, but uh, there is a too, low, too much freedom. But the solution set of an inhomogeneous system, which is solvable, is a special solution plus an like, so affine space, which doesn't go through zero, and there's a minimal norm equation. So if you have redundancy, that's what you learn from linear algebra, take the minimal norm equation. So if every element in your input space has a representation with square summable coefficients, then you go for, the, for this. Now, uh, uh, I want to just mention uh, the aspect of uh, functional analysis. I would like to talk about, or I will talk about function spaces which are having continuous variables, so in the real line or so. And it's clear that there is never a finite dimensional basis. People tend to say these are infinite dimensional vector spaces. But you should not think that it is meaning that you have a nice infinite dimensional, uh, infinite basis. We also think it's Finite is not good enough, so you have to take limits. And that's why the understanding of what, how to take limits or so is quite important. So the rest of all will leave out. Yeah, and uh, I like to do a lot with MATLAB. And MATLAB actually is, in spirit, very close to uh, the notions of, of Dirac with the bras and the cats. Uh, where bra, uh, well, the cats are, as if you remember correctly, the column vectors and the bras are the row vectors. But in principle, it's one of the objects and the other the linear functional, sort of the linear measurement. So in that sense, I have this. So I mentioned already the, the term rigid Hilbert space. So uh, I will talk mostly about uh, this um, banner Gelfan triple, which for me is the, one, the most important one. Uh, I was introducing this in the winter school 40 years ago. Uh, it was. Uh, special case of a Siegel algebra there for the S and it was minimal there for the zero. At that time it was just playing around with function spaces or so. Meanwhile I'm of course quite happy that some people call it Feifling algebra so it's you can say it's a Feifling and Gilpin trick or so. But what is it? Now uh, 
the original definition is quite different, but uh, nowadays I'm trying to, to explain how one can define it to engineers. And it has a lot to do with the spectrogram. So roughly speaking, the original definition was if you take a function, a signal of final energy or an L2 function, then you get this picture and the energy, the L2 norm of this picture is the same. So maybe up to a constant. That means you have an isometric transformation, a unitary or an isometric embedding from the signal space, from your Hilbert space into a bigger one. You can think of these oscillating graphs, which are the sound signals, and the nice pictures, which are kind of smooth. If you really take a Gauss function as your window, which has some advantages, then you get the Fox space. So these are not just bounded uh, square integrable functions, but they are even analytic and so on. But this is not my business. If I explain it in a naive way, I would say, well, a bounded continuous function, so some sound signal changes the period, and, and so that should have a spectrogram. What do you need to do a spectrogram? Well, you need uh, a window, something maybe a partition of unity, which is smooth. You should not cut brutally, but even engineers know this. So you cut, and you take the Fourier coefficients of this part. And then you go to the next position, and you take the Fourier coefficients. Now, uh, each of these Fourier transforms is a bounded continuous functions, but what I'm doing is I'm taking Riemannian sums, so essentially I'm taking uh, the Fourier transform of this part, and then I'm taking again the little pieces. So I'm doing something like, uh, I call it the Wiener norm, because you know, the Wiener was using it. And the short version is, if somebody is giving you a function, then you take the local maxima at each point, so you can also say, I'm just taking the upper Riemannian sum of this. So again, what is the procedure? Inside all the bounded continuous functions, for me, the good ones are the ones where if I cut into pieces, take the Fourier transform, which is the continuous function, and then take the upper Riemannian sum. And so, of course, I have two labels at each position in time. I have some frequency because this is now on the frequency side, so I'm thinking vertically. This is finite. And if this actually is a decomposition, first a decomposing time and then a frequency, if this double decomposition is absolutely convergent, so all these pieces sum up, then I'm saying it's a good function and I take it into the space. Or you can do it in a continuous way and you say, I'm taking this spectrogram. And well, we know it's bounded, continuous, and we know it's square integral. So what is the difference between a function of, let's say, image, two function, which is square integrable, now I'm requiring integrability? Well, you may have slow decay, so that only by squaring the small values, they are getting small enough to go down. Remember, 1 over x is not integrable, but it's square integrable, of course, let's say, from, from 1 to infinity or so. So that's, that's more or less how I define this space. Yeah, so uh, another pictogram, I mean, this was a consequence of complaints from my students. I like to use many function spaces. Uh, then uh, they were saying, oh, there's so many function spaces. And then I said, well, no, I, I tell you, there are not so many. And I realized there are really many that I'm using all the time. Uh, but I was developing symbols for them. And uh, I'm not sure, I think in this talk I didn't prepare other symbols, but uh, for example, and one would give, I would have a symbol something like this. So you would say, taking the unit ball, then it would be a caro. But I would like to use the symbol such that if I apply the Fourier transform, I rotate by 90 degrees this way I'm stretching a little bit. So what should such a picture tell you? The yellow object is my nice Hilbert space, and that's L2. It's not only invariant on the rotation by 90 degrees, but even any rotation angle. So if you know what the fractional Fourier transform is, then you, you read correctly from this picture that S0 is a space which is invariant under all the fractional Fourier transform, actually under all the canonical transformation in the whole metaplectic group. Is, that's something I hope to discuss with Professor Wolf. Uh, then, of course, uh, I didn't mention it, a zero is uh, invariant under the Fourier transform. Well, if somebody is giving you a spectrogram with a Gauss window, 
and you would like to know what is the full, the spectrogram of the full transform, just take the picture and rotate it by 90 degrees. Integrability is not changed. So what is the spectrogram of, a, of the pure tone? So I'm just imitating it. Something at some height. So that's the frequency. What is it in the full picture? It's a vertical line. It's, it's going over into Dirac. So for me, a uh, way to, uh, to explain the Fourier transform, and maybe I'm staying with this picture, is to explain what is a banach alpha triple morphism. So measure a uh, uh, structure preserving things. Just to uh, that's that's kind of uh, something inspired by a course in, uh, or a seminar on category theory, which I took as a student. It's very simple. When you have a group and you have a mapping which maps one group into another group, you're saying it's isomorphic if the, the, the group law is preserved. The logarithm is a good thing, multiplication goes into addition and vice versa. That's why when I was young we had these logarithmic books to do multiplication. Uh, you have uh, maybe uh, linear mappings, which are from vector spaces to vector spaces. You can do your linear combination before you map or afterwards. You have topological spaces. Well, something which is convergent should be conversion either here or here, or topological vector spaces, and so on. Now, we have a lot of structure with three la layers. And you see here, I have a bundle space and another bundle space, but they are isomorphic. This is not another mapping, but it's the continuation, or you can say that uh, the inner one is the restriction of the outer one. And uh, this here is a further. Uh, extension or so. Now there's a small problem which you can see from this example here. L2 is not dense in L infinity. You never can approximate uniformly a constant sequence with constant 1 with square symmetrical function sequences. Because here the finite sequences are dense. So if you would be able to take constant 1 and approximate with some finite sequence and you take a constant 1 here, at some point you have to finish, and then the difference is still 1, so it's not possible. But, of course, you would say, well, constant 1 is the limit of more and more 1s. From minus 10,000 to plus 10,000 is already a very good approximation. If you translate it in an abstract situation, then it's coordinate-wise convergence, which is weak star convergence. So, each time you're applying this functional to something from your pre-dual space, you, you observe everything is fine. So, for me, a Banach Delta triple as a morphism is some mapping which preserves all the three layers, uh, but it is also preserving weak star to weak star convergence. And that has the very big advantage, you know, uh, with Banach spaces, there are some good Banach spaces which are reflexive and others are not reflexive. This is really behaving like the finite dimensional case. So uh, that's maybe all I should say about this. So, yeah, why the word, why did I choose the name Banach Alpha Triple? Because there are some people that I cannot say how representative who call the standard, the situation where you take the Schwartz space and inside the two, and then the dual space, the type of distribution, and they call it the Gelfand Triple. Clearly, Gelfand, that would be Lenkin or so, or using such a situation. Uh, what is the big difference between uh, this situation and this situation? The Schwartz phase of rapidly decreasing function is defined with a lot of seminoms. Therefore, rarely people are using very much the topological structure of the dual space or so. The good thing is a nuclear for this space and nuclear sounds like kernel, therefore it's really good you can prove a kernel theorem. But even in my situation I can prove a kernel theorem, that's why I'm also promoting it. So uh, yeah, now going into uh, Something which I was writing before I was reading a little bit again, uh, books in quantum theory last night. Very much in spirit of what I was telling you. In a finite dimensional vector space, the ideal situation is to have a basis. Not so ideal, but still okay, is to have enough vectors, like my five vectors, allow to represent. But you may have to take a minimal known least square solution. You may have not finitely many, but infinitely many more. That's this situation here. Or you can go to the continuous fluid transform, then you're in a much worse situation. 
inverse, you can describe the inverse fluid transform, just the formula, and here you have to the e to the plus 2 pi i s, and then you put the argument, uh, by saying, well, we are having a continuous superposition of pure frequencies. But it's continuous, and it's an integral, and if you take partial, I mean, Riemann in terms of this, then you will take some coefficients and some pure frequencies. These are objects which are trigonometric polynomials. So somehow to say that this is, this is, a, it's kind of only the limit, it is something with spinning blocks which are not so nice or so. So, yeah, okay. This is uh, not so good. And that's why uh, uh, there is a much better, uh, an alternative way, a very interesting one, and that's bringing us to time frequency analysis. So depending on your terminology, you're saying it's just the reconstruction from the short time fluid transform. So I have my sensor. So my sensor is the window which I move to some position, and then I check multiplied with the e to the exponential function. say, well, it's kind of like a metallic sensor. Is there some metal here? Or is there energy? Is there some big value in the spectrogram? So you have seen the dots for the carburetor that was kind of, oh, there was a lot of response here and here, and there were no, not, no such response at other places. So, so this scalar product labeled by the time and frequency axis is the spectrogram or there is many names. And now what is a good way to reconstruct? You're just doing more or less the same that you did before. So you're saying, well, what is the free transform? This is, I have mentioned to you, this is a scalar product between, a kind of scalar product between f, my function that I want to expand, and my family of continuous things. <coughs> but uh, now we are having a situation where these spinning blocks, the g number is a nice function, can be a Gauss function with amplitude. So somehow the idea is, well, these are cheap tones, <coughs> the coherent states. So it's acoustically, it's like duh, duh. At every time, at every point, you can do it. And if you smear together, you can prove it. Now, we had and I was just reading the same statement now, I think, in the book of Cloud last night. He mm -hmm. says, well, that's the big difference. The building blocks are in the, in the Hilbert space or so. And I was also, we had this, this analogy, but then we said, well, did we prove it? And Ferenc Weiss, who is an expert in classical Fourier analysis, was then proving, yes, if you take a window which is reasonable, for me, and in theory, it means it has to be in a zero. You should not take the rectangular function. But any classical solubility kernel that you can think of is okay. Any function which has two derivatives and is integrable is okay. So everything which people normally would like to use, which is good, Riemann integrable, and with a little bit of smoothness, can be taken. And then you can take Riemannian sums of this form. What does it mean? Instead of writing a two-dimensional integral, you're just taking a big enough rectangle, you're sampling it reasonably fine, and then you're writing this sum, and then the answer is yes, this is approximation uh, with a certain amount, and it depends only on the function f. And I also add that, uh, so then that it's, that's really a limit in the sense of norm. Now, uh, another occasion that, yeah, so, so you get, maybe you get maybe something like this. You, uh, if you take the g here, here, you get this, but now at the moment we get an approximation. Now, uh, I'm also usually referring to the uh, people who are selling you CDs. Uh, you are in the concert, you listen to this concert, and then you can buy the same piece of music by the orchestra, and you have a perfect recording. I'm saying that's a little bit cheating from a, I don't know, ontological point of view. Uh, they're only selling you the information that they have for the duration of the piece of music, maybe just a short song, it's three minutes long, and they are giving you the information from zero to 20 kilohertz. So they are giving you a discrete summation of this. The good thing is that you cannot hear the difference because no human being can hear anything realistically beyond 15 kilohertz or so. Uh, I was testing myself, I'm doing like 10,000, 11,000, so depending on age, so it's not such a bad thing. And so I think in, also in terms of functional analysis and real life, Digital images at a certain resolution 
nowadays we're not complaining it's big pixels or so, no. We cannot see the difference, we can produce nice posters, and this kind of approximation is finite dimensional approximation of continuous object at any given resolution. So it's very much like pi. We don't need the infinite decimal for the discussion, it's good to know it exists. We can go as far as we need, but in reality we are saying up to that level it's reasonable and afterwards it's just computational burden, storage, uh, waste or so. Now one of the very interesting thing is was that Dennis Gabor was saying well instead of uh, writing such an integral and actually I don't know if we had was starting from this continuous one but we can explain this idea. He was saying we sampled it on the regular lattice, this number lattice where you take the Gauss function for some good reason, uncertainty and so and you take the integer shift, so you have the Gauss function here oh, slightly overlapping, therefore non-orthogonal another Gauss function, another Gauss function and then you take the pure frequency, so more or less you're practically, you think you do full analysis of, of the pieces uh, Why was he doing this? Because he said, well, if we take a lattice which is too large and I'm over emphasizing it I'm taking Gauss function here, and the Gauss function here, and so on, and I take very sparse frequencies, then clearly it's orthogonal, but it's not spanning. I was proving a theorem which I called piano reconstruction theorem, which was simply, well, I mean, if you have a musician who is listening to the piece of music, you can write down the score. How can it be? I mean, if the representation coefficients are not unique. Well, I'm not playing at the continuous scale, I'm playing at some discrete uh, pattern and my piano is not tuned in a continuous way so I have this stair so if I know this is a, what the tuning is and what the time is, I can reconstruct so I mean there are independent families, real basic sequences is in modern terminology where you can reconstruct but if you want to represent everything in, in such a form you have to find the coefficients and the trick is there is that there's now theory which I skip uh, if you take a lattice which is large, uh, fine enough. So he was saying you should not take a times b less than one because then you have redundancy. I'm saying we better live with a some small redundancy because then we know that there is not the only representation but the minimal norm solution exists. We can guarantee every L2 function has L2 coefficients obtained by minimal norm solution. And that's, these are the GABA coefficients. And then the main, uh, one of the things is how do you compute these things to so essentially you fabricate from the data which is uh, the, the lattice that you choose and the atom that you choose you fabricate some operator which term has to be positive definite and you solve an equation so it's just try to take this so normally we say the g tilde is just the inverse frame operator applied to the g so but I don't want to go into the details of this so you can compute it and uh, it turns out, and that's a bit like uh, if you're going too close to dangerous places, it's more costly. So if I take a lattice with A equal B one half, so you would say compared to Gabor, I have redundancy for four times as many samples. Then the G tilde is almost looking like my G divided by four. So I have four copies and that's fine. If I take the lattice for constant 0.99, then I can prove mathematically it's okay, but the coefficients will be much larger. So there's not a nice relationship anymore between the L2 norm of this and the L2 norm of these coefficients. There is a constant, but a bad constant. And some signals are hardly represented. So of course these which are living in the middle with very bad frequencies and so on. Now there's a way out. So kind of this is somehow saying the G numbers are like a system which is uh, like a risk basis, not really, but like a spanning system. So uh, uh, I cannot use, uh, get the coefficients by just taking the same system or so. But what I can do is I can modify my G to make another, which I call H, and then I can make it a tight, a so called tight frame. Now, just without looking at this, I, I found this, find this is a very nice situation. Somebody tells you I have a system where you can get the coefficients in just by taking this color product. They say, well, isn't this a characterization of complete orthonormal basis or so? And the answer is no. 
it's a, it's a characterization of completeness given the orthogonality. If somebody is giving you an orthogonal system, you have such an expansion if and only if it's an, a complete basis or so. My standard way of showing you to is take this, I, I try to make an autonomous system. Try the projection, so uh, Mercedes harmonious. For any orthogonal projection of an autonomous system in a higher dimension, lower to, to a lower dimension, you always get this. So there are now experts on, on, who are able to design it where it's not always easy to get uh, that these have all the same lengths, which is the case here. But you can always do it, so they are not, don't have lengths one anymore, they are a little bit shorter. But what is the advantage of such an expansion? Well, you can say, well, if somebody is stealing one of the coordinates, you can still reconstruct. So kind of it's built-in redundancy in an expansion system, and that's what, what we can do. Uh, yeah, now, uh, maybe I'll skip this for a moment. So if you're doing the same thing in a discrete setting, and that's also maybe interesting for some of you, then I'm choosing a discrete Gauss function. I'm doing this now for signal lengths uh, 480. So you have roughly minus 240 to 240, and I put the zero in the middle. And this is a discrete version of the Gauss function, which has a Fourier transform and an FFT, which looks like this. Uh, FFT is not norm-preserving, but you, the length is squared of n, so that's why the amplitude is a bit different. Now I can show you what this time shift is. This is just shifting the window here. On the Fourier transform side, it gives a multiplication with a pure frequency. So you have cosine and sine. Or you're doing a frequency shift, which is you're transposing. So instead of the, you make the. And that's multiplied with a pure exponential, but it shows as a shift in this equation. Yeah. So the continuous theory says, I'm taking this family of coherent states uh, by applying time frequency shifts. And for me, time frequency shift is applying a time shift first and then a modulation of frequency shift afterwards. And then, uh, uh, yeah, maybe I'll skip this. You can ask, for example, that's not so interesting now, if after every point represents now a vector in this space. So every point has a horizontal and a vertical coordinate. And I would produce a sound with the synthesizer of this. Can I produce arbitrary sounds? And then the example is showing you, for example, here I took 1,020 points, so about three times as many as the dimension was. The quality and the condition number is only 16 compared to a very regular system where I have only redundancy 3 over 2, so I have 50% more points than the dimension, so it's like this 5 over 3 in my situation. And the condition number is less than 2, so this is what a Gabor situation, a Gabor expansion is. So to come back to this situation, I'm saying instead of having an integral representation with spinning blocks which are inside this space, we try to discretize and we try to come back. Now, uh, to come also to explain the short term, uh, the, the banach gelfand triple If I'm starting with a signal which is a good signal, what do you expect to get for these coefficients? And the answer is, I'm getting N1 coefficients. What if I'm synthesizing with, this, with such a sum with N1 coefficients? I'm getting a zero. What if I'm starting with F, which is a Dirac, a pure frequency, any bounded function or so? I'm getting bounded coefficients. And then I was even trying for another talk recently to say, well, what is the largest thing uh, that allows me to get a bounded spectrogram. So roughly speaking, I'm really trying to think now, not in mathematical terms, but in terms of, of real signals or sound signals. So I have to be able to take my window, put it at different frequencies, and all these building blocks would, should give a bounded coefficient, uniformly bounded. Well, I can fabricate a Banach space out of all these windows. And then it would be the dual space of this Banach space. Now, the Interesting part is you say, well, I don't like your window. I don't want to use a Gauss function. I take another bump function. I don't like your lattice. I like a hexagonal lattice or so. But each time you're building this space of all these infinite sums, you're always getting a zero. So it's exactly a zero prime, which is the reservoir of all temporal distributions or the signals or real objects that have a bounded spectrogram. So uh, the 
we have now already an idea what what uh, S zero is with integrable Fourier transform, and two is square integrable, and S zero prime is is the space of all things distributions, if you want, which have a bounded spectrogram. What is no convergence in S zero prime? Well, this is just uniform conversions. That's a bit too strong. What is the relaxation? Uniform conversions of a compact subset. We call your CD player with three minutes and 20 kilobytes. You have a very good approximation of this finite rectangle and the frequency. So, uh, yeah, this, this slide was meant to say the good thing uh, I'm also working was working in wavelet theories. For wavelets, you have time shift and a scaling. There is no discrete version of it. So you can approximate with finite dimensional things, but you cannot have a discrete group, which is like the affine group. In the case of, uh, of time frequency analysis, you can take any elementary group, especially a finite group, and you can do everything, and also my experiments are done with a finite group. So I'm using F15 instead of the Fourier transform. Still, I can do a downsampling. That's, that's interesting. But I, I'm very interested also to, to, to see it's not just similar, but how I can use it in the approximation sphere. Okay. Now, let me see. I think I should. Um, yeah, maybe this I should show. If my window G is a Gauss function, then the dual window has very often these characteristic features. Either it has a, an inverse bump here, other than a slight negative part, or it's oscillating. So if you're trying to take something which is part of the multi-collection of Gauss function, which is too close, then you have a Gauss function which is too close. So first approximation, yes, part of the means you take a Gauss function, but the next one should be negative, but then you have to go to here. something which is quite nice. Instead of giving it a sharp bump or an inverse bump, you have a flat area here, you have small side lobes. So to use such a window, even if it's not completely positive, is certainly a good compromise. That's what the other engineers is doing. So now I would like to push the, the high frequency a little bit. I can see the slow it should be more louder. So. And then I'm changing this uh, like rock profile or whatever. If you do this in a time changing way, you are saying you have a set of coefficients about the with numbers, and then you go on. And the interesting thing is because we have redundancy, it's not exactly like a full multiplier. So it's not a diagonal matrix, but it's an operator.
Thank you. 